At this point, I think we're ready to run our Arduino project on two AAA batteries for a year. But first, let's revisit that bug from episode 6. If you remember, we had set the brownout detection to reset the processor if the operating voltage dips below 1.8 volts. When I reduce the power supply voltage, which mimics two AAA batteries, to below 1.95 volts, we see the 328P start to reset over and over again. We obviously don't want this, as it will just drain the batteries faster and will end up sending garbage data to the receiver. After researching the matter, I think the best solution is to actually turn off the brownout detection completely. If you look at the 328P datasheet, you can see that the MCUSR register will hold reset conditions. Ideally, the BORF bit would be set after a brownout reset. However, after much fiddling, I could not discern a brownout reset from a regular power-on reset, for example by putting in new batteries. I predict that on a regular power-up, you have a risk of causing a brief brownout reset, so both the BORF and PORF bits will be set every time. So if we can't tell when a brownout reset happens consistently, we have to resort to something else. The next best thing I came up with is to measure the battery voltage and then stop transmitting whenever it falls below a certain point. The good part about this is that we can turn off the brownout detection circuitry, which saves us a little bit of battery life. We can't use the batteries as a reference, as they change over time while being drained. However, we can use the 1.9 volts from our regulator, as that should stay pretty steady. To start, we'll need to disable the brownout detection completely using fuses. To do this, remove the BME280 and RFM95. Connect the Bayer 328P to your Uno, just like we did in Episode 3. In Arduino, make sure you have the Mini Core 328P selected with a 1 MHz internal clock. Select BOD and disable it. Select the serial port for your Arduino. Make sure Arduino as ISP is selected and click Tools Burn Bootloader. The battery voltage should be higher than the regulated 1.9 volts, so we'll need to use a voltage divider. To prevent the voltage divider from constantly drawing current, we'll add a couple of transistors to act as a switch to turn the divider on only when we need to take a measurement. I'll connect the base of the NPN to Arduino pin 8 on the 328P and the middle of the voltage divider to Arduino pin A0. We can calculate the voltage drop across the collector and emitter of the PNP, but it's actually easier just to find the ADC number through testing. I'd like to thank the folks at Bald Engineer and Mushi Meter for showing this selective voltage divider circuit. Because we're using 1.9 volts as our reference, we know that the 10-bit ADC will read 1023 for 1.9 volts. We're using a 1 half voltage divider. So as the batteries drop to 1.9 volts, our desired cutoff, the ADC should read around 1 half of 1023, or near 512. We'll want to go just below that value to ensure that we can squeeze every last drop out of the batteries before we dip into that dangerous 1.8 volt zone. Here is our final circuit. You'll want to program the 328P using the USB to serial converter and then remove it once programming is complete. Notice that I've attached the raw power supply to the emitter of the PNP in the divider circuit. In our LoRa weather code, I added a cutoff ADC value. After some playing around, I found that 505 worked the best as it allowed us to stop transmitting between 1.8 and 1.9 volts. I added our divider control pin and ADC A0 pin, which I enable in setup. I still disable the ADC here, as we'll turn it back on each time we take a measurement. At the beginning of our loop, before we take a measurement, we make sure power is turned on to the ADC and that it's enabled. I'll discard the first ADC reading to let the reference voltage settle. Then I take an ADC reading. If the ADC value is over our cutoff voltage, we take the measurements and transmit them over the LoRa radio. Otherwise, we just go back to sleep. Before calling our go to sleep function, we disable the ADC and kill power to it to save on current draw while sleeping. In our go to sleep function, we can get rid of the brownout detection disable features since we've turned off brownout detection using fuses. Let's upload and test this. With the code running, I can receive measurements over LoRa as long as my power supply voltage stays over 1.9 volts. When I dip below that, I no longer receive messages. While the processor might still wake up and run, which will drain the batteries further, we at least won't get any bogus readings. At that point, it doesn't really matter, as we're using alkaline cells, which are meant to be thrown away anyway. We're still drawing above the average desired current of 100 microamps, so we need to figure out how long to sleep. We know this is going to be longer than 4 seconds, so we need to change the watchdog timeout. 
The maximum we can set the watchdog timer timeout is eight seconds. So we'll likely need to wake up and go back to sleep multiple times before taking a sample. To do that, we first change the watchdog timer timeout to eight seconds by setting the WDP3 and WDP0 bits. Back at the top, we set a new constant parameter that tells us how many times we want to sleep before taking a new measurement. We'll start with three sleep cycles before a measurement, which results in three eight-second sleeps between measurements. We also create a wake-up counter global variable and set it to the max wake-up number so that we will get one sampling done on reset. At the beginning of the loop, we'll want to increment the counter and check to see if it's over our specified number of wake-ups. If so, reset it back to zero and take a new measurement. Otherwise, go back to sleep. Let's upload and check this. We'll measure the high current draw by first adding a one ohm shunt resistor on the return path back to the power supply. With just the one ohm resistor, we can see that the whole device pulls around 94.3 milliamps while transmitting for about 41.4 milliseconds. We see that there are a couple of moments of higher current draw before and after transmission. We measure those to be around 2.9 milliamps and 3.5 milliseconds for the first one and 2.1 milliseconds for the second one. There's a section where the processor is just waking up, but it's a little too low for our scope to measure. So we take out the shunt resistor from the return path and insert our current sense circuit from episode 7 into the high side. Note that we're using a 1 ohm shunt resistor here. The 328P wakes up twice between our transmission bursts, and we can measure that each wake up. They seem to be around 0.41 milliamps for 0.22 milliseconds. We move to the transmission burst and see that the wake up bit we couldn't measure before is pretty spiky in its current draw. I'll make a guess that it averages around 0.8 milliamps for 26.6 milliseconds. Finally, we want to measure the sleep current. So we switch the 1 ohm resistor with a 10 ohm resistor to amplify the voltage drop a little more. While the processor is asleep, we measure the current draw. We see that it averages around 38.2 microamps. This is also a good time to test that our sleep is really 8 seconds between wakeups. We need to do a little math to figure out the average current draw and figure out how often we should be transmitting. Here is a simple representation of the current draw of our system over time. We have two distinct periods. The first is the transmission period followed by several cycles of sleep with a brief wake up to increment the counter. We need to figure out how many 8 second sleep cycles we need to run on two AAA batteries for a year. First, we figure out how long our total transmit period is, which we find to be about 73.6 milliseconds. Then we figure out the proportion that each current draw section is active out of the total 73.6 milliseconds. We multiply that proportion by the current draw. Add each of these sections up to get the average current draw for the transmit section, which we find to be about 53.6 milliamps. We do the same thing for the sleep section. We sleep for a total of 8,000.22 milliseconds during each cycle. We find that the tiny portion where we wake up to increment the counter doesn't add up to much, so our average sleep current is still about 38.2 microamps. Then we need to figure out the percentage of time we're allowed to transmit in order to have our total average current draw be less than 100 microamps, the number we came up with in episode 2. We'll call this percentage P. Solve for P and we see that we can transmit no more than 0.115% of the time. We then use that to calculate the total time for one transmit and one sleep cycle. We find that the total time is 64,000 milliseconds or 64 seconds. We subtract out the transmit time to find that we need to sleep for at least 63,926.4 milliseconds in order to last for a year on batteries. Because we sleep in multiples of 8 seconds, we divide that calculated number by our sleep time, 8,000.22 milliseconds, to find that we need 7.99 sleep cycles. Because sleep cycles need to be in whole numbers, we round that up to 8. To check ourselves, let's recalculate our expected total average current draw. We know that we transmit 73.6 milliseconds out of our total cycle time. We multiply that by our transmit current. Then we use our 8 times 8 second sleep time divided by our total cycle time to get the proportion of time that we sleep. Finally, we multiply that by our average sleep current draw. With that, we see that our expected average current draw is 0 0.0997 milliamps, right at 100 microamps. We did it! We can say we successfully designed a system that should, in theory, last for a year on batteries. We still need to make one last change to our code though.
we need to change the number of wake-ups to 7. We said that we need 8 sleep cycles, but remember that with our code, there's always one sleep cycle that's not counted. With 7 wake-ups, that should be a total of 8 sleep cycles. Let's upload and test this. When we watch the scope, which I sped up for obvious reasons, we can see the wake-ups occurring every 8 seconds after the first reading. After 8 of these sleep cycles, we see the processor wake up, take a measurement, and go back to sleep. And we see the whole thing takes about 64 seconds, just like we calculated. We went for a long time without testing with actual batteries, so let's do that. I'll connect two AAA batteries to my device. We see the first reading come in, and I'll start a timer. A little over a minute later, we get the second reading. We're done with creating our battery-powered LoRa device. If you'd like to take it further and miniaturize the whole thing, you'll want to follow this fritzing diagram. Feel free to check out my KiCad series if you'd like to make your own board out of the parts we mentioned in this series. You can then mill your own board on something like a Bantam Tools milling machine, which I cover in a separate video series, or you can send your boards out to be professionally fabricated. The final form of our code can be found in my LoRaWeather GitHub repository. In Software Arduino, LoRaWeather Client is the device code, and Software Python LoRaWeather Server is the code I was running on my Raspberry Pi. The hardware directory contains the breakout boards I put together for the RFM95 and the ADP171 CurrentSense amplifier. That wraps up this Arduino project to product series. I hope this has helped you take your embedded projects to the next level, namely, how do you sleep components to run off of batteries for a very long time, like a year? Remember that because of that radio, if you plan to put this device into an enclosure and sell it in the United States at least, you're gonna need FCC certification. That'll be another series for another time. That being said, please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this, and happy hacking.